Welcome back. So, today we're going to keep talking about recursion. We also have a new MP out. It's hard, fun, interesting, relevant. Okay, so, last time we talked about trees, we introduced recursion. Today we're going to keep talking about recursion, give you practice with this. This is not an easy concept to wrap your mind around, but it is an incredibly powerful new tool in our toolkit that we can use to solve certain types of problems. So again, if you're starting, you know, to, if you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, this is something particularly for people that haven't seen it before, take some time to get used to. I remember, I don't remember much from my college days, it was a long time ago, but I do remember learning recursion, sort of, in the sense that I remember being very confused about it for a while. And if you feel that way, that's okay. It's one of these things that you're going to see it now, you're going to see it again in 173 in a theoretical context. You're going to see it again in 225 and in downstream courses, because this is an incredibly powerful idea that we can use as a tool to solve problems. All right, so I have some good news today. Pretty much all good news, actually. I have to reject the usual good news, bad news metaphor, so let's talk about some good news. So the class did really well on midterm one, so congrats. That was, that was really great. Um, the, it's hard to compare with last semester. The last question was a little bit more difficult because we prevented you from using an array. I will talk about how to solve that question um, next week, maybe, if you guys want, right? Um, and if I look and I see that a lot of people struggled with it. But uh, overall, I'm very pleased with the performance of the class on the midterm. So congratulations, you did well. Other good news. We released a new MP this morning, a couple minutes ago. MP4, this is the last of the MPs for this semester other than the final project, which I'm going to talk about later in class. This is it. We're dropping in on Friday because it's hard. You have two and a half weeks to do it. So you have this weekend. The early deadline is Monday the 8th, not next Monday. So please don't panic. You don't have to get 40 points over the weekend. You have to get 40 points over the next two weekends. But this is not an easy MP. It's a fun MP. And it's an extremely relevant and connected to what we're doing. This is also something that's going to give you great practice uh, for things that you're going to learn in downstream courses. You're going to see graphs on this MP, and then you'll see those again in 173 and 225. If you can pro start programming, learning how to program with them in, in 125, you're going to be really well set up for the things you're going to do in the future. Now, um, I'm sure we'll get plenty of questions about MP4 on the forum, and, and we'll answer them. This is not a chemistry MP. It may look like a chemistry MP. It's not. This is an MP about different types of operations on graphs. That, most of which are going to implement recursively. The other thing I want to say about this is that this MP has been set up intentionally so that it's easy to get most of the credit for it, but it's very hard to get all of the extra credit points. Some of you are programmed into this sense where it's like, I have to get full credit on everything, otherwise I'm not a worthwhile human being. Um, don't approach MP4 that way. You get, you know, there's some extra credit points on the MP. So there's 10 points of extra credit. Those 10 points are tough sledding, okay? So I would not encourage you necessarily to do those unless you get really sucked into it and you're having a lot of fun and you want those. They're not worth it from a grade perspective. They're not going to change much at the end of the semester. Um, but again, it should be straightforward with help from the course staff that are very excited to assist you with this MP. It should be straightforward to do well on this MP. It is hard to get all the available points. It's kind of like the difficulty level really ramps up at the very end. And again, that's not something that we're unaware of, but I just want to caution you about it from the perspective of how you approach the MP. But again, this is an incredibly cool MP. It's a lot of fun. I think you guys will enjoy it. All right. And it's out, right? So it's up today. You have this weekend. You have next weekend. You have the weekend after. Um, we'll have office hours as usual. The course staff is available to help. Uh, we'll, and, and so, you know, we're going to do a lot to try to support you as you work through this. We'll set aside time in the next two labs to work on this as well, right? But please, you know, I know it's, April, it's almost April, it's getting nice outside. Um, you know, some of you might be a little distracted by what's going on in, uh, in the earth. Things are going to warm up. You know, it's less fun to be in front of your computer. But do not underestimate this assignment. It is not easy. But I'm also happy that we still have a month left together. So we have a lot to talk about over the next month. Um, this MP is going to get us halfway there. And then mid-May, we're going to get you started on, sorry, mid-April, 
we're gonna get you started on your final project. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of class. All right, but let's go back to Wednesday's material and let's, let's review. So on Wednesday, we started talking about the next data structure that we're going to cover in this class, which is a tree. A tree is an incredibly common computer science data structure, of which there are many, many different variants. And it's used to store data, particularly when data has some sort of hierarchical relationship, but not always. Trees themselves have a hierarchical data structure, but what you'll find when you go on is that there's a lot of cool things that you can do um, with data that's stored in a tree that might not have anything to do with the data being hierarchical. So for example, if we set up a tree in a certain way, it can be easy to look for things in the tree. This is an ex extremely common data structure. A tree consists of a series of nodes where every node in the tree except one has one parent. So the three nodes there we refer to as uh, children of this parent node, and every node in the tree can have zero or more children. So here I have a parent node. That parent node has three children. So this parent has three children. Each one of these uh, child nodes that are highlighted has a single parent. Every node in the tree except for one has a parent. The only node without a parent is the root node at the very top of the tree. So we refer to that node as the root. It's the node at the top typically, you know, and, and we, could, we could lay them out the other way. Typically, you see trees visualized with the root at the top and the structure headed downwards, but there's no reason for that. We could flip it upside down. So when we look at trees in this class, the root will be at the top, but the real way to identify the root is it's the only node with no parent. So if I flip this upside down, the root would be at the bottom, the tree would go upward. That may be a little bit more what we would expect from a tree, um, but this is how we usually look at them. This is how you'll see them in computer science typically visualized. I don't know why, I don't know who made that decision. Top of the tree is the root. Any node in the tree that has no children is referred to as a leaf. So every tree has at least one root and only one root and at least one leaf. A single node tree, the root is the single node and it's also a leaf because it has no children. In this tree, I've got five nodes, two of them are leaf nodes. There's the ones all the way down at the bottom. When we implement recursive algorithms on trees, the leaf nodes are important because that's typically where we want to stop. So we talked last time, and we're gonna review about how we can break a tree down into smaller parts that are subtrees. But when I get to a leaf node, I'm done. So if I get down here and I've removed this subtree from the larger tree, I have no more work to do. So this is frequently where my recursive algorithm will stop also known as the base case, the place where I can't make the problem smaller anymore. We'll talk about levels in trees. You guys will do some work implementing some algorithms to determine uh, what, uh, what a, tr a tree depth is. So the level of a node is the number of links it takes to get to the root. So if I'm at the root, I'm at the root, so I don't have to go anywhere. It takes zero hops to get to the root. If I'm at this node down here that has level three, it takes one, two, three steps to get up to the root. The maximum, the node at the deepest level, the node with the largest level in the tree defines the tree depth. So there's always one or more nodes that are as far, are the farthest away from the tree, from the root of any nodes in the tree. So here I've got two nodes at level one, but then I've got this other branch of the tree that keeps going, and finally I have a leaf node that's at level three. So the tree depth is defined as the leaf node at the highest level, the leaf node that's the farthest away from the root. And if you think about it, if the node isn't the leaf node, it can't define the depth, because if the node isn't the leaf node, I can go deeper by going to one of its children. All right. So we talked last time about ways, so trees are a great place for us to start thinking about how to approach problems recursively. We talked last time about iterative solutions to a problem, so I repeat the same thing over and over again, which are a great fit for data structures that are linear, like arrays and lists. A tree is not linear. A tree has more complicated structure to it. And so this is a good place for us to start thinking about recursive algorithms. So a recursive algorithm tries to make the problem smaller at every step. So when we try to solve a problem recursively, we either do one of two things. We either try to make, break the problem into smaller pieces, 
or once we find the smallest possible piece of the problem, we start combining the results together. So let's look at how we count recursively. So we're gonna break, we're gonna take this tree that has six nodes, and we're gonna talk about an algorithm, not an implementation, but an algorithm for counting it. So a lot of times, this is the template that we're gonna use when we approach problems recursively. We're gonna figure out, how can I break the problem into smaller pieces? At some point, I'm gonna get to a problem that's so small that I have to solve it. And then, frequently, I need some way to combine the results back together. So these are the three things that I would encourage you to think about when you start to develop the recursive algorithms on trees starting today, and those homework problems will continue next week. You guys will get lots of practice recursing and implementing recursive algorithms on trees. Okay, so let's say I want us to count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at node five. How do I do that? So I'm starting at the top. So at, at each, so I have three choices here, right? Well, really, at every level, I have, at every step, I have two choices. I can either make the problem smaller or solve the problem. I solve the problem once I can't make it smaller anymore, right? But what am I gonna do here? Let's say I start at node five. Which, what's the right thing to do at this stage? Should I make the problem smaller or should I, am I in a position where I can solve it immediately? What should I do? So I'm looking at the tree rooted at node five. Yeah. Yeah, so remember with trees, this is also true with lists and arrays, and we'll come back and talk about this feature of lists and arrays later, but I have this nice recursive property of the data structure itself. So if a node has children, then there are two subtrees that are rooted in either its right or left child. Both of those subtrees are smaller than the entire tree. Almost by definition, they don't contain the node that I'm at. So if I'm at node five and I'm looking down the tree, what do I see? I see a subtree rooted at node three and a subtree rooted at node 10. So how do I make the problem smaller? I know that both those subtrees have fewer nodes than the entire tree, or fewer nodes than the tree rooted at node five. So how do I make the problem smaller? I have no idea how to count the number of nodes in this tree yet. But I'm at node five, and what do I know? The count of the number of nodes in the tree has to be equal to what? Yeah, David. So the count of the nodes in my right tree, subtree, plus the count of nodes in my left subtree, plus me, plus one. So if I'm at node five and I'm looking down the tree, I have no idea how many nodes are down here yet, but I know one thing. I know that the number of nodes in the tree is me, one, plus however many nodes there are in my left subtree, plus however many nodes there are in my right subtree. I just mentioned that both those subtrees are smaller than the tree. So I've made the problem smaller. Now I'm creating more problems. So you might think like, uh-oh, and we're gonna see, if you're not careful, that if you don't write your recursive algorithm properly, it can create so many problems that it never finishes them. And eventually it's gonna run out of memory and crash. But we're not, we're not there yet. Let's, let's think about it. So I started with one problem, which was count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at five. And now I have two problems to solve. I need to count the number of nodes rooted at the tree, uh, count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at three, and count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at 10. So I'm just restarting the same algorithm. Again, imagine the rest of the tree just isn't even there. Just look at the blue part. How do I count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at three? What do I know about the world? I don't know. I know that three has one child, but I have no idea what's going on deeper in the tree. But if I'm at node three, how many nodes are in the, node three knows that the no, number of nodes in the tree is equal to one. Well, there's the node I'm at, so that's one. And then what other, what other parts of the tree do I need to count? I've got a subtree rooted at seven. 
So when I'm at node three, so I'm, I've, I have two problems to solve. I need to count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at three and count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at 10. So three doesn't know how to solve the problem either, but it knows what the solution is. It knows the solution is one, the node three, plus however many nodes are in my, I guess this looks like a left subtree, my only subtree. Okay? So I've made the problem smaller because I know that both of my subtrees or either of my subtrees is smaller than the entire tree, right? Okay, so now I started off with one problem to solve. After I got to this level, I have two problems to solve. Now I still have two problems to solve. I have to count the number of nodes in seven and I have to count the number of nodes in 10. Okay, now we've gotten to something that looks a little bit different than what we've done before. I've reached a leaf node. So how many nodes are in the tree rooted at node seven? This is the point where I have to solve the smallest subproblem. Yeah. There's one. Bingo. If the node has no children, there's no subtrees left to count. And so how many nodes are in the tree rooted at node seven? One, that's it. Okay, so I started off with one problem to solve, then I had two problems to solve, then I still had two problems to solve. Now I've got one problem to solve because I've counted this subtree. So now I can start working on this other problem. And I'm gonna apply the same principle. I'm gonna say, okay, I'm at node 10. Node 10 has children. So there's two subtrees rooted in node 10 so I know if I'm at node 10 that the number of nodes in the tree rooted in node 10 is one, 10, plus however many nodes are in 10's left subtree rooted at node nine, plus however many nodes are in node 10's right subtree rooted at node one. So I'm still making the problem smaller. So now I had, I had one problem to solve, now I've got two. I've gotta count the number of nodes rooted at node nine, and I've gotta count the number of nodes rooted in the tree rooted at node one. But these are leaf nodes. And so again, I'm done. This is the smallest subproblem. Once your recursive algorithm reaches the smallest subproblem, it stops. It knows the answer. So if you give me a tree, if you give me a node with no children, I know how many nodes are in the tree rooted at that node. It's one. So I'm done. I count nine. I have two problems to solve. I count nine. I've got one problem left to solve. I count one. Now I'm at the stage where I'm gonna to start to combine the results together. So I counted the number of nodes in the tree rooted at seven, that was one. I counted the number of nodes in the tree rooted at nine, that was one, and I counted the number of nodes in the tree rooted at one, that was also one. And so now three knows how many nodes are in the tree rooted at itself, which is two, it's one plus itself. 10 also knows how many nodes are in the tree rooted at itself. It's the number of nodes in its left subtree plus the number of nodes in its right subtree plus one to count itself. And now five knows how many nodes are in the tree rooted at itself because I counted its left subtree which had contained two nodes, I counted its right subtree which contained three nodes, and I add one node to account for node five. Now I'm done. So, I successfully broke the problem into smaller pieces until I found a smallest subproblem, which were leaf nodes that I could count immediately, and then I combined the results together. This is a classic pattern for a recursive algorithm. Questions about this? David. Good question. So the question is, how do I know which, which subtree to count first? Anyone, anyone know the answer to this? It doesn't matter. I heard the answer, yeah. The count of the number of nodes in a, in a, in a tree rooted particular node is left plus right plus one, or right plus left plus one, or right plus one plus left. Addition is, you know, associative, so we're fine. Other questions about this? Again, you guys are going to do so many of these that you're gonna love them by the time you are done. So many of these, but this is the pattern. So this is today's problem. Um, I'm not going to solve it again, because it's last time, but this is what you guys are doing today. 
next week, we will start introducing you some different problems in this space. So again, recursion is a topic that can be difficult to wrap your mind around at first. But when you're designing your recursive algorithms, here's my suggestions about how to proceed. I think these three strategies help. So at some point, your recursive algorithm has to solve a problem. It has to, if you make the problem smaller and smaller and smaller, but you never solve it, eventually you're, you're, what's gonna happen is your uh, program is never gonna terminate. The algorithm never stops, and it's gonna crash. This is known as a base case. A base case is a point where I stop recursing and I start returning a result. So for our tree counting algorithm, the base case is when I get to a leaf. So when I counted this node, I had to restart on both of my children. When I counted this node, I had to restart on both of my children. When I counted this node, I had to restart on both of my children. When I get down here, I'm solving the smallest subproblem. And so I don't restart the algorithm. Instead, I start returning. So that's known as the base case. The problem has to get smaller at every step. This is the other thing that people sometimes mess up. So if the problem is not getting smaller, you're not making any progress in solving it, right? So if instead of, you know, instead of starting the algorithm on my right and left child, I started again on me, then I'm not making the problem smaller because the tree rooted at me is the same size as the tree rooted at me. So if I restart on myself, I'm not making the problem small. So when you use recursion to break problems down into smaller pieces, the pieces actually have to be smaller. If they're not, you're never going to get to this base case. You're never gonna to get to the point where you have a problem that's small enough that you can solve it easily. And then combining results from your recursive calls properly. And this is something that's very specific to the recursive problem that you're working on. So what you're gonna see as we start doing recursion on trees is that there's a common kind of template or pattern that starts to emerge in our recursive algorithms, but one of the things that differs a lot from problem to problem is how we combine the results. And, and we'll look at some, well, you guys will get a chance to do a bunch of different examples of this on the homework problem, and we'll also talk about a few in class. All right, so recursion doesn't have to be on trees. You can apply recursion to solving other problems. So here's an example of a recursive factorial implementation. Factorial is defined as, factorial of n is defined as n times n minus one times n minus two all the way till I get to one. And so let's use this to try to identify the different parts of a recursive algorithm, because it's a little different to look at than the ones that we've been doing on trees. So what's the base case here? What's the point at which I stop making the problem smaller and actually start being able to solve it? Yeah. Yeah, so it's right here. You can see that if I have a value of n that's larger than one, then what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, I don't know how to compute the factorial of that number. But I do know that the factorial of that number is that number times the factorial of n minus one. So the factorial of five is five times the factorial of four. The factorial of nine is nine times the factorial of eight. So I'm making the problem smaller, but when I get to one, I have to stop somewhere, right? I have to stop. When I get to one, I know the answer. Factorial of one is one. And so I return it immediately, right? What's my recursive step? Where am I making the problem smaller? Yeah. Well, it's really right here, actually. Yeah, it's this bit. Factorial of n minus one. When we've talked about trees, we've talked about making the problem smaller by having the tree have fewer nodes. Here I'm making the problem smaller by making the number smaller. So again, I don't know what the factorial of 13 is, but I know it's 13 times the factorial of 12. Well, now I have a smaller problem. 12 is smaller than 13. If I keep doing that, eventually I'm gonna get to one. So this is my recursive step. I'm making the problem smaller. And then how am I combining my results? Sometimes these two things are, are combined right together. And that's the case here. 
So factorial of n minus 1 is the recursive step. Where do I combine the result? You want to answer, want to give me that answer again? Yeah, it's right here. This is, this is how I combine the results for factorial. Again, I don't know if I'm trying to compute the factorial of 52. I don't know what it is, but I know that it's 52 times the factorial of 51. So I'm saying, okay, well, I'm going to compute the factorial of 51, and when I'm done doing that, I know the answer, because I'll just multiply it by 52. And then, so then I start computing the factorial of 51. I say, well, I don't know what that is, but I know it's 51 times the factorial of 50. And I keep doing this and I, until I get to 1, and I'm done. Okay, so that's where I'm combining my results. Again, sometimes combining the results and actually recursing, or the recursive step, are combined together so closely that it can be difficult to distinguish between them. All right, so remember, this is one of the most common mistakes when you implement recursive algorithms. This is a problem that you're going to have on our homework problems for the next week. It's also a problem that you're going to have on MP4. I guarantee it. You have to reach the base case. Otherwise, your program is going to keep trying to make the problem smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, but it's never going to make the problem so small that it can solve it. It's never going to reach the point where it can actually start to put a solution together. This piece of code has this problem. It can fail to reach the base case. How? Yeah, over there. Yeah, what happens if I compute the factorial of zero? Okay, well, I say, is, is n equal to one? Nope. So I say, well, I know it's the factorial of zero. It's zero times the factorial of n minus one. n minus one is negative one. So then I say, oh, well, now I have to compute the factorial of negative one. Okay, well, I know how to do that. I'm just gonna, you know, multiply negative one times the factorial of negative two. How do I compute the factorial of negative two? Well, I have to compute, it's negative two times the factorial of negative three. And so if you run this code on a negative result, you're gonna get something that looks like this. Either it'll time out, or you're gonna get something called a stack overflow error, which means that your program ran out of memory and, and crashed. This code works fine for Factorial gets big quickly. Works fine for, you know, reasonable values of factorial. It does not work fine if I give it a zero input. Yeah, zero or below. Yeah, so again, this is one of the most common mistakes people make when they start working with recursion, is you have to convince yourself that eventually your recursive code is going to get to the base case and stop. If it doesn't, you know, it'll, you'll get an error like this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's too big. Yeah. So the question is, what happens if I try to use something like 20? I warned you, factorial gets big fast. Remember the ON analysis? Factorial is like a vertical line, right? So what happened here? It's a good review. Yeah, in the back. Integer overflow, indeed. So an int in Java can only store a certain range of values. Once the int gets too big for that range, it turns out that it wraps around and starts to become negative again. So if I do this, yeah, got it. Oh. Why is it angry with me? Oh, I have to return it along. Thank you. There you go. I told you it got big. Right, you can very easily get it to overflow long, too, if you want to. Right, I mean, factorial is, factorial is a rocket ship. Let's try, like, 30. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So we're already pretty close. Yeah. Good question. Good review of, of math in Java. You guys get plenty of chance to see these sort of bugs and warts in our later courses. Other questions at this point? So, other questions about these strategies? We're going to do a problem in a minute. Okay. So, let me offer some advice about this. So, how many, like, how many people here already knew about recursion before they took the class? Okay. 
How many people think it's awesome? And they want to use it all the time. Okay. Yeah. So there's always some of those people. Um, and then there's always, there, how many people here feel like it's weird and you don't understand how it works and you're a little terrified of it and you'd probably write a loop instead if you could? Yeah, okay. So a lot of times, you know, so again, I want to make this very, very clear because it's, there are people have weird misconceptions about this. There are no problems that you have to solve with the recursive algorithm. Zero. There are also no problems that you can't solve with the recursive algorithm. Zero. So it's not about not being able to solve a problem. There's a quiz question on this, and every year somebody emails me and is like, no, that's not true, and I'm like, no, trust me, right? There's an algorithm for taking a recursive solution to a problem and turning it into an iterative solution. And I think you can also uh, do the reverse. So it's not about a problem being unsolvable using one approach, that's just false. It's about what works better, what's more elegant, what leads to a cleaner solution that's easier to understand and easier for you to understand and implement, okay? Recursive solutions can sometimes be difficult to understand when you're getting started. Now, when you get used to them, they'll make a lot of sense. But there's a style question here, and this is, this is sort of a design question. So your goal as a programmer should always be to write clear, concise, elegant code. It's not to show off the fact that you know how to write a recursive algorithm. All right? No one cares, you know? If you go to a job interview and you write this really ganky recursive algorithm to solve a problem, you're not gonna get the job just because you wrote a recursive algorithm. The interviewer will probably be like, what are you doing? You know, just use a loop. Um, so the goal here is to write clear code. It's not to, you know, show off that you can use a particular solution technique. Depending on the problem, if an iterative solution is more clear, use an iterative solution. If a recursive solution is more clear, use a recursive solution. There are problems where recursion is a great fit. And there are other problems where recursion just feels sort of like you're just showing off, right? Um, yeah, so don't use recursion just to be cool. Very few people think that that's cool. Um, here's the other thing people say. Well, the recursive solution was shorter. Who cares? You know, the goal here is not to minimize the number of lines of code you write. One long line, you know, in Java, you can actually take your entire program you can't do this on our homework because we run check style, but you can take your entire program and write it as a single line. It's fine. You know, in Java, like, use, Java uses braces and semicolons. So you can actually take your entire code and write it on a single line. If that's really important to you to save lines of code, right? Now, at that point, your code is totally unreadable. Um, so, you know, brevity here is not always the answer. I've seen, you know, one or two line in, uh, functions that are incredibly hard to understand. Or it was just like, look, dude, just use 10 lines and make it clear. So this is, you know, minimizing the number of lines of code is not the goal either. The goal is to minimize the cognitive load on you and other people who are using and reading your code. It is not to save lines of code in the universe. Okay, the computer doesn't care either. All right. So again, here's another implementation of factorial. This is an iterative solution in contrast with our recursive solution. So, it's got a loop. Like, how do I calculate factorial? I start with one, and I multiply one by a series of, you know, incre increasing numbers until I get to the number that I'm computing factorial for. And this works fine. It's not that much longer than the recursive solution. Some of you might prefer the recursive solution. Some of you might prefer the iterative solution. There are trade-offs here, in terms of style, um, in terms of other things, right, as well. But this isn't about just using recursion to be cool. It's about finding the right solution to the problem. With factorial, I would argue, you know, if you like the recursive factorial implementation, great, use it. If you like this one, great, use it. They're fine, they're both equivalent. To some of you, this makes more sense. To others, the recursive algorithm makes more sense. And to others of you, the recursive algorithm is going to make more sense in like two or three years once you've written more recursive code and experimented with, with other languages. All right. Do I have time to do this? We sort of did this last time. Um, let me, all right, let me, let's skip ahead and let's do a problem. All right. So here's a, a practice problem on trees where we're gonna get a chance to design a recursive algorithm together. So given a tree, I wanna figure out how many nodes in the tree 
have a right child with a value that's greater to their left child. Does that make sense? The node, and at that node, it has two children, that's a requirement, and the value of the right child is bigger than the value of the left child. So when I'm looking at the values in the tree, just not, not just the structure. Okay, so, what's, let's talk about how to do this. So what's a recursive algorithm for solving this problem? How do I make the problems, there's, there are a couple things to think about. How do I make the problem smaller? When do I stop? And how do I combine the results together? How do I make the problem smaller? We're working with trees. This is not a, with trees, the answer to this question does not vary very much. Right, so given a tree rooted at a certain node, how do I know how many nodes in that tree have a right child with a value that's greater than the left child? How do I make the problem small? Yeah. Well, so let's come back and think about, so we're designing a recursive algorithm here. Okay, so, if I'm at, if I'm at a, let, let's say that the node that I'm at has two children. What are the smaller problems that I'm trying to create here? Yeah. Yeah, so this is another counting problem, right? The, well actually, I'm doing this a little bit differently. So this is another counting problem. The count, of the number of nodes in the tree with this property is gonna be equal to the count in my right subtree plus the count in my left subtree. And then, if I have a right and left subtree, I need to examine whether or not I should contribute as well. Right, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So to, if I have two children, then it's possible that the value of my right child is greater than the value of my left child, and I should count myself, but it's also possible that I should, okay? So the base case here is also very similar to our earlier counting problem. If I get down to a leaf node, by definition, a leaf node does not have a right or left child. And so it cannot contribute to this count. And so I can stop. Now, why can't I stop if I find a node that only has a left child? That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, because it's possible that the tree rooted at my left child it's possible that node has two children. So I can't stop just when I get to a node that only has one child. I have to keep going all the way until I get into the leaves. And again, this is something that's very common to recursive counting problems. I'm gonna stop when I get to the leaves. So the recursive step is that I'm gonna break the problem into my right subtree, my left subtree. Both of those problems are smaller. And then I'm also have, gonna have to consider myself. And I'm gonna combine in the results by the number in my right subtree plus the number in my left subtree, and now, unlike the uh, counting, where I was just looking at the size of the tree, the number of nodes in it, now I actually do a little bit of work. I have to say, if I have a right and left child, then I need to compare their values and use that to decide whether or not I should count myself. All right, so let's do this together. Okay, so I've got, this is our binary tree class with the embedded uh, inner class for the node. So, as we do frequently with this particular way of using trees, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna restart my algorithm on the root node. And I'm gonna write a second private version of this function that takes a node, takes a current node. Okay. So let's go back here to our outline. Okay, so let's, let's do our base case. So how do, I identify the, how do I identify a base case here? When am I gonna stop? If I'm in a node that has no children, exactly. So I'm gonna say if current.right is equal to null and current.left is equal to null, then I'm done. There are no smaller problems to solve here. I can just return zero, okay? 
Good. Now again, let's go back and look at our outline here. Okay, so I'm gonna, I wanna consider my right and my left subtree separately. So let's do this. Let's say I'm gonna set this count variable to zero. This is the local variable. How do I count myself? What has to be true if I'm gonna count myself at all? If my right child has a value that's greater than my left child, what do I need? Well, what, do, what needs to be true about this node before I can even consider whether or not my right child is greater than my left child? I have to have a right and left child. Yeah. So I'm gonna say, if current.right is not equal to null, so I have a right child, and current.left, not equal to null. And let's just do this all in one statement. And current dot right dot, what do I call this? Value. Value. Or, oh. It's greater than current dot left dot value. I've gotta make one change to this, I'm sorry. This is a bug from last semester. I'm gonna change these nodes so that they contain ints. You guys will get a chance to do this later with comparable nodes, but for now, I don't wanna deal with that. So I'm gonna change the, my nodes so that it contains an integer. Sorry about that, it's my, it's my fault. This also has to take ints. I'm ruining my example. Int and an int, okay. Let's at least make sure that still runs. Oh, why is it mad at me? Oh, yeah, these are ints now, so they don't. Okay, fine, so this is, this is okay. Let's just complain about that. Traveling object. Oh, it's this guy, yep. Okay, good. Sorry about that, I'll, I'll fix this example after class. But, okay, so we're still, so if, so now I've got a case where I have two children and the right child's value is greater than the left child's value. So what do I do? I count myself, so count is equal to one. So now count is zero if I either don't have a right or a left child or if I have both, but the value in my right child is not greater than the value in my left child. So now I've counted myself. Now how do I combine, what do I do now? I need to count my right and my left subtree. How do I do that? Well, I have a function here that can count the number of nodes in a subtree with this, with this, uh, with this uh, property. So let's say if current.right is not equal to null, I'll say count is, is equal to right greater than left current. And I can do something similar here. I can say if current dot left is not equal to null, count plus equals right greater than left current. And then I'm done, return the count. Uh oh, I have a problem. What's wrong? Yeah. You're counting, or you're calling right the left. Yeah, I've made, I've made one of these classic mistakes. I'm not making the problem smaller. I'm starting over at the current node. Ah. Again, easy mistake to make, even if you've solved a lot of these before. Okay, so I wanna start over on my right subtree and on my left. Now the problem should be getting smaller. Let's see, I need to make this a little bigger to have some interesting results in it. It's like a zero most of the time. Make sure that this is, get properly, yeah. Let's see if I can get this to create a tree that's actually gonna have its property. This 
maybe a function of, well, you know what, hold on. Let's do this. Let's say one, three, two. There we go, okay. It's not totally broken. All right, so if you recall how our add algorithm works, you probably don't, it's fine. Add will always add to the right child first. So when I create a tree from these values, one, three, and two, I end up with the root node with value one, a right child with value three, and a left child with value two. So in this case, the answer will always be one. If I change these around to one, two, three, I get zero. So this looks like this is working at least for this simple case. Now, I can make this cleaner in the same way that I did last time. Anyone have a suggestion about how to do this? So this is correct, but it's a little bit more verbose than I might like. It would be great if I could get rid of all of this. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so let's add a base case if current is equal to null. So now I've got two base cases. Either I've walked off the end of the tree, or I've reached a leaf. Because now what I can do is I can say return count plus the count of the number of nodes in my right subtree plus, I'm gonna need a new line in here somewhere, there we go, the count of number of nodes in my left subtree. So now I can simplify this a little bit, should still work, make sure, yeah. And we'll do this a lot when we do this on, on this trees. We'll let ourselves. this is just a, this is a trick that allows us to make our code a little simpler. Rather than handling the case where I don't have a right or left subtree in my code, I just add a base case for the case where I've walked off a part of the tree that doesn't exist. In most cases, that always means that I return zero or I don't do something at that note. Dave, yeah. Well, here I'm checking if they're both null. Here I'm checking if they're both not null. It looks similar, but it's not. And I think actually I can even get rid of this whole thing over here. Let's try that. Yep, still works. Yeah, now I don't have to worry about getting to a leaf, because what's gonna happen when I get to a leaf? I'm gonna restart the algorithm on its right or left child, its right or left child are both null. I'm gonna hit that, that check right at the top. I'm gonna hit my base. Right, other so we'll come back. We have a whole nother lecture to uh, talk about at least one more, if not several. We're gonna see recursion in a couple of other contexts. I wanna, um, meh, I'm out of time. I'll come back and we'll talk about this on Monday. Okay, we'll have some announcements about the fair on Monday. For now, let's get started on MP4. I have my normal office hours this afternoon. Uh, we also have our normal office hours today. I would encourage you to come by and get started on MP4. This is not an easy MP. It's a fun MP. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Enjoy the warm weather. I will see you on Monday.